Hello and welcome to the After Sermon Podcast, where we look at a Bible topic, character, or concept. And today we're looking at the love of God in the Old Testament as we explore the sermon, Old God, New God, Mad God, True God. two of our series on the love of God in the Old Testament and what we have deemed uh, the cursed <laughs> episodes of the After Sermon podcast. Yes, that is right. This is the third time that we're recording this podcast. And you know what? This time it's worked. We've got the audio files. We're good Woo! to go. At least so, in part one. <laughs> without... That's right. That's right. Part two remains to be seen. We'll see. <laughs> but of course... Uh, this podcast would not be complete without Kiralee Josie. Hello! Who, uh, of course, is an all-star in her own right. Yes, ev- everyone and, is, um, in their own way. Everyone is, that is correct. Uh, even even shooting stars break the mold. Indeed. Or, uh, did I get that line right? <laughs> only shooting stars. It, yes. Only shooting yes. stars. There we yes. go. So... You might be wondering, what's with the vague Smash Mouth references, Christopher? <laughs> what's with this? Uh, what's with these Shrek name drops? We are looking at uh, a very intriguing story oh, today, yes. and we're going to get straight into it. Um, for the recap, uh, I'd recommend either going and listening to the recap we gave in the last podcast episode, uh, episode thirty-eight, or listen to the actual sermon itself. The link will be in the description below for both of those. Uh, But essentially what we're talking about is the concept of the God of the Old Testament. Is he loving? Is he angry? Is, uh, what's he like? And is he the same God of the new? And we've established the God from Genesis through to Revelation is the same God and his character of love is consistent throughout. And so last time we looked at the story of the flood with Kira. So if you want to go and hear about how we see the love of God in that story, um, Kira does an amazing job going verse by verse through the story and really dissecting it and getting into the nitty-gritty details to find that out. So I highly recommend you go listen to that. But you can also listen to this episode independently of that. Uh, but for the for the best uh, listening experience, listen to the first part, I think. Oh, and sure. that'll flow into this conversation here now. So for this story, we're going to look at a story that perplexes many people when they read the Bible because uh, <laughs> it's very unusual. Bizarre. And it features a donkey. And this donkey, at one point in the story, decides to talk. And uh, here is a legit question, Kira. Donkey in the Shrek franchise, all all the characters in Shrek are fairy tale characters, right? Do you think the writers of Shrek were trying to make either a subtle or not so subtle dig at this biblical story? um, I've never thought about it. But now that I do, I'm... Because I can't think of any other fairy tale story with a talking donkey, well, right? I mean, <clears throat> magic happens, and I'm sure a lot oh, of yeah, animals guess. do start talking. That is true. But it seems, you know, Shrek being every man, maybe it makes sense. Who knows? That remains to be seen. Yeah. But um, I think I'll sadly put to bed the Shrek references for the rest of the podcast. There we go. <laughs> Good it's, work. <laughs> it's done. This, unlike onions, this oh. podcast does not have layers of jokes. <laughs> <laughs> of course. All right, that's it. No more. No <laughs> more. That's it. Okay. We got that out of our system. So, uh, listeners, let's turn to Numbers chapter 22. We're going to see uh, where we see the love of God in the story. And we're going to address the, the part with the donkey. But to me, it's... The donkey is kind of the part that gets a lot of the focus, Mm. but it's actually not the coolest or the most important part of that story. It's the donkey's kind of like the bell, the bell and whistle to the story. But um, we 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 often miss out what's really going on here. So we're going to talk about the donkey, but we're going to go a lot deeper into this and see the richness of this story. 
And basically to summarize uh, or to give some context to this before we start reading. The nation of Israel, they've been in captivity and slavery in the land of Egypt. And Moses, by God's direction, has taken them out They're on their way to the promised land. And as they're going through the promised land, they keep encountering these uh, nations that want to attack them. And every time the Israelites defend themselves, they are victorious. They win. And so this king of Moab, his name is King Balak. He's getting a bit nervous because the Israelites are headed his way. And he's freaking out because he knows the track record that they have. Mm -hmm. And so King Balak goes to a man called Balaam. And he wants Balaam to curse the people of Israel so that he doesn't have to fear them being victorious of them uh, if ever they get locked into battle. And we read that Balaam lives in Peor and he's a professional diviner. Uh, and Peor was a place of worship to Baal, which is a pagan god, an idol. And the, the worship of Baal is really just gross. Like it was full mm -hmm. of uh, like temple prostitution, um, in some cases, child sacrifice. Like yeah, it was uh, not good. D disgusting. Yeah, not good. And uh, being a diviner was something also not good. Uh, in the Levitical law, God has a strict zero tolerance policy for anyone practicing divination, uh, which is communicating with evil spirits. So on the surface, this the story isn't uh, that unusual so far. It's just a pagan king consulting his local soothsayer to curse a foreign people. Like this is pretty run of the mill everyday stuff so far. Um, but where does the story get weird? Let's have a read. Um, let's have a read of verses eight and nine. Would you be able to read that for yeah, us? Yeah, no Kira? worries. Um, I'm reading from the new international version. Spend the night here, Balaam said to them, and I will bring you back the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabite princes stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, who are these men with you? Did you want any more? Uh, yep. Keep going. Um, Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Sippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. A people, has, a people that has come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I will be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You must not put a curse on the people, because they are blessed. So these messengers, they've been sent to Balaam, and God, uh, ba uh, Balaam goes and consults God, and God says, Do not curse these people. Um, now, what's interesting is that... He, Balaam is uh, a pagan. He does not really uh, believe in the God of the Jews, and yet here he seems to be directly contacting Yeah. Him. And there's uh, an ancient painted text called the Dia Allah inscription. Uh, I'm mispronouncing <laughs> that, I'm sure. It is uh, spelled D-E-I-R space A-L-L-A. -L -L -A. Yeah. And this ancient inscription it recounts a version of the story of Balaam. It calls him the prophet of Peor, calls him a seer and a diviner. Except this time, in this story, it says he communicates with a pantheon of gods, including Shagar and Ishtar. So, uh, it makes you think, like, what was going on in Balaam's head? Yeah. Because uh, from the perspective of the biblical authors, he's talking to God, but... Um, the people from his culture who retell and recount this story, they think he, he's talking to uh, their gods. So, I don't know. Kira, what's going on here? Um, I think... So, wait. So, the document was written by who? Just people from the time? Like, bar worshippers? Yeah, it's just... Yeah, I suppose yeah, so. Yeah, um, so I guess it's just the way that different people would have interpreted it, right? So perhaps yeah. for Balaam, he was hearing what he thought was, you know, the, the pantheon, the, the whole range of different gods at the time. But when the, when the Israelites heard about this, when they, when they heard about the story, they knew that it was their one true God who was speaking to Balaam. So that's what they wrote down. Mm. That's at least what I think. I think that's really good. 
that's a much better explanation than what I have in my notes here. So let's go. With that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what really sticks out to me is that God is willing to communicate with this uh, prophet of a terrible, terrible religious system. Yeah. And uh, as we go through the story, the overwhelming theme is that God is faithful to everyone and that God gives chances to everyone in this story. So Balaam, he initially rejects Balak's offer and the messengers go back to King Balak and they go, he, he wasn't interested. So Balak goes, all right, that's it. Go take more money to Balaam. And so they come again and Balaam, he's going like, oh, he's looking at the money. Oh, this is some good stuff. And he decides to go. Now, uh, let's read chapter, uh, verse 21. Verse uh, 21. No, let's read verses. Let's read 20 and 21. All right. Um, that night God came to Balaam and said, since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but only do what I tell you. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. Okay. Now, did you pick up on something as you read that? Um, um, there's a very interesting plot point in there that we often read over in those verses. Right. So, I think... The idea of only doing what I tell you. Yes, and a little bit before that, what is the condition that God gives? He gives two, two conditions. He says, one is, only say what I say, but what's the other condition for Balaam leaving in the morning? Um, and it's in verse 20. So, yes, that's true. Um, so since he's been summoned, and then, so only do what I tell you. Actually, yeah, so um, your translation may put yeah, it in a different so. way. Mine says, uh, mine says, if the men come to call you, rise and go with them. Yeah, yeah. So God so puts, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, God puts a very clear uh, rule to this. He says, you're only allowed to go if they call you in the morning. But then in verse 21, it just says, Balaam gets up and he goes. Um, so he has directly disobeyed God's command here. And his motivation for doing so is uh, greed. It's the money. And we read that in, um, we won't turn here, but if you're interested to read it, Second Peter 2.15 and Jude verse 11 talk about Balaam and his love for money and going uh, above and beyond that so much so that he disobeys God. So he's willing to curse Israel for monetary gain. And that's where we pick up in verse 22 through to 29. And I'll read this out for us. Then God's anger was aroused because Balaam went. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards, with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So Balaam struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went further. He stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. Balaam's anger was aroused and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you've struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have abused me. I wish there was a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. And this is the point where everyone just goes, What's going on? This is... <laughs> this story is weird. Yeah, for sure. um, so God sends... Uh, f first of all, God sends an angel. Um to Balaam and 
the reason is he's trying to stop Balaam from going on this reckless path of sin. The angel is actually there as a mercy to Balaam to stop him from doing something that is wrong. Uh, and then God allows the donkey to kind of see in the spiritual dimension to save Balaam. So God's showing more mercy to Balaam. And then he even allows the donkey to talk. Like this is miraculous. There's no natural explanation. Oh, this yeah. is a supernatural event. More mercy. Uh, so, yeah, God is willing to bend the very rules of nature to save this man who has directly disobeyed him that morning. <laughs> so don't leave And <laughs> wants to put... Yeah. And he wants to curse his covenant people just so he can get some extra money. Like, yeah. God is under no obligation to show Balaam mercy here. And yet... He's willing to do something this weird and this extreme just to try and get the message through to Balaam's thick skull. Yeah. Um, and I, I love the fact that, like, Balaam also kind of isn't even phased by this. Like, he, he's so stubborn and set in his ways that he just, like, starts having a convo with the donkey. And uh, he says, you know, I wish I had a sword in my hand. That way I could just kill you. Like... He's not in a good frame of mind at all. Uh, he's angry. He is upset. And yet, in the story, the one person who has every right to be angry and upset is God. And yet he shows mercy to Balaam by trying to prevent him from making a bad mistake. <clears throat> yeah. Any thoughts on the, on the donkey, Kira? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think it's, I think it's interesting because um, in... I, well, this story is one that I know that I learned as a child um, in mm. in just, you know, morning to church. And I didn't really know any of the context surrounding the story. All you just hear is, like, you know, this talking donkey. So it's, you know, a little bit bizarre. And I, I think it's good to get a little bit further into it and think, like, all right, what's God hoping to do through this donkey? Because this makes absolutely no sense. Mm. Um, I think that's cool. Yeah, yeah, and if you just look at, if you again, uh, similar to what we said in um, uh, your story of the flood that we looked at, when you came across the verse about the Nephilim, people want to get into the nerdy details and the lore and mythology. Oh, what a, <clears throat> what's God trying to say here about the Nephilim? Like. That's not the point. That's the, even though that's a fantastical element about the story, it's not actually the point the author's trying to emphasize or convey. Um, the point of the donkey here is not, whoa, whoa, it talked for like a sentence. It's, the author's trying to say like, for what purpose would God have to do something yeah, like this? Yeah, exactly. You know? Why, what is the driving motivation here? And here it is, to show Balaam as much mercy as possible, to give him as many second chances from doing the wrong thing as possible. Yeah. Um, do you mind quickly reading for us verse 35? Yeah. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. So God just kind of reiterates to Balaam what his purpose is, and he goes, All right, now that you've been, you know, Shown a second chance, only say what I say. So Balaam, he meets with King Balak, and they go to a high place called Baal ba Bamoth. And uh, I find it weird, again, that this high place, this place of worship is for pagan deities, and yet when Balaam, in good conscience, gives an offering there, God is willing to accept mm. it. Um I think it shows that God is willing to sometimes ignore the ignorance of human beings. Um, if people have a clear conscience and are doing the best within their uh, cultural time period, uh, the, the Apostle Paul says that God sometimes winks at people's ignorance during certain periods of time. Yeah. So I, I love that little aspect of mercy there. Uh, so Balaam goes to curse Israel, but he instead blesses them. And in verse 10, he talks about, uh, this is in chapter 23 yeah. now, talks about Israel being numerous. You can't count yeah. them. And that is, uh, that is a fulfillment of God's uh, covenant to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12, where he says, your descendants will be as you know, numerous as the stars and the sand and all that. And uh, of course, Balak is not so happy with this. 
Um, he he gets really annoyed at Balaam. He goes, "I told you to curse them. <laughs> that wasn't a curse. That was a, a blessing." You know, moment, like, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Can I get a refund <laughs> on uh, my curse, please? <laughs> So Balak takes him to another high place, and this place is called Mount Pisgah. Mm. And this is fascinating because Mount Pisgah is another name for the mountain where Moses would eventually die. Yeah. And it's the place where Moses would look out at the promised land and he'd watch the Israelites go in. So here Balaam gives uh, a, a, a blessing on Israel about how good and, uh, how faithful God is and how he'll ensure that no harm comes to Israel. And sure enough, that is fulfilled as Moses one day from that same mountaintop will watch the Israelites walk into the promised land. <clears throat> and uh, mind you, all of this is done in the presence of King Balak too. Mm. So God is using this as an opportunity to witness to this foreign king. So God is, uh, God is witnessing to everyone in this uh, circumstance. Yeah. Uh, then in chapter 24, uh, the same thing keeps happening. Um, if we read verse 1 through to 3, uh, just briefly paraphrase, it says, when Balaam comes to the next high place to uh, what King Balak wants is to give a curse, it says uh, that Balaam didn't use sorcery, but he set his face towards the wilderness he raised his eyes and saw Israel, and the Spirit of God came upon him. So, Balaam himself has been transformed through this story and through these events. Like, this third time as he comes to bless Israel, instead of using his weird and wacky um, sorcery stuff, he's filled by the Spirit of God, mm -hmm. and God is working through him this time. So... I just love that transformation that Balaam takes on this journey. Yeah. Um, and uh, the fourth blessing, this is maybe my favorite um, <laughs> part of the whole thing. Uh, if you want to have a takeaway passage from the story of Balaam, donkey's cool, forget the donkey. This is where <laughs> the, the real juice, the meaty, vegan meaty stuff <laughs> is. This is where it gets really yeah. good. Um, do you want to read for us verses 15 and 19 of chapter 24? Wait, so 15 and 19. Ah, oh, 15 okay. through 19, yeah. sorry. Then he uttered his oracle. The oracle of Balaam, son of Beor, the oracle of one whose eyes sees clearly. The oracle of one who hears the word of, words of God, who has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who falls prostrate and whose eyes are opened. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. <laughs> he will crush the foreheads of Moab the skulls of the, all the sons of Sheth. Edom will be conquered. Seir, his army, will be conquered. But Israel will grow strong. A ruler will come out of Jacob and destroy the survivors of the city. So when you read that, what are your initial impressions? What are you thinking from that text? Well, um, there's a few little verses in here that make me think that it's pointing to Jesus. All right, which verses are we well, looking at? Well, if we look in verse um, 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. So, mm. you know, seeing Jesus, but he's not here yet. Um, and talking about how a star will c come out of Jacob and a scepter will rise out of Israel. And so, you know, we know that Jesus comes from the line of Jacob. Um, and mm. a scepter, that idea of the scepter of promise um, being passed through Jacob's line was where Jesus was going, the line Jesus was going to be born from. Yeah. Um, and it, uh, I, I really love that. I see him, but not now. Yeah. I behold him, but he's not near. Like he's seeing like a, a fuzzy image of Jesus, yeah. like far off. It's so, it's such a cool description. Yeah. And, uh, this is the same prophecy that the Magi, uh, or the three wise men would use 
to get to oh, Jesus wow. as a child. Because uh, it talks about the star coming out of Jacob, a scepter rising out of Israel. So I love the fact that here this prophecy is being given by a pagan magician. Yeah. And in the future, another group of pagan magicians will use this to find and meet the actual Messiah that Balaam only saw unclearly and far off. And so God is using this as a witnessing opportunity for both Jew and Gentile. And he's using it for people both in the present that it's been given to and in the future, a thousand years from now. Mm. That, that blows my mind. Yeah. That is such a, like, it's insane. that is so effective that like the efficiency that God has through these blessings is incredible. Yeah. Um, and then the final messages are, are all given to these nations, warning them that if they don't repent, um, imminent judgment is coming upon them. So again, God's showing mercy by giving a warning to these people, giving them a heads up, like, hey, you better quickly fix things up, otherwise things are going to get pretty bad. Mm. So this strange and unusual story, it's one in which God shows his covenant faithfulness and mercy to Israel. He shows uh, faithfulness and mercy to the king of a country who wants to curse Israel. He shows mercy to a greedy pagan prophet who disobeys him. And he shows it to the Moabite officials and the messengers and Jews and Gentiles, both in the present and in the future. That that's This yeah. story is crazy. Mind-blowing stuff. Um, yeah, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. And um, that's what I mean by we get distracted by the oh, donkey. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't even know about the rest <laughs> of this stuff until, like, last year when I was reading through. I was just like, wait, there's Balaam does more than just have a talking donkey? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> wait, there was context? What do you mean? Yeah, I know. Uh, like, and, and that's what I mean. The donkey is in service of the main thrust of this message, yeah. which is God is merciful and God is faithful. And it shows that he is faithful to humanity, both in the past, the present and the future, which is just yeah crazy. It, awesome. It's just insane. So uh, now we get to do the, the where are they now segment. <laughs> And <clears throat> unfortunately, it's not that great. Yeah. So what ends up happening between Moab and Israel? Well, Balaam and Balak, they go back to their homes, but they soon become allies again. And uh, in Revelation 2.14, we're told that Balaam and Balak seduce the people of Israel. Mm. And we have a, an account of that story of their seducing. What they do is they, they want to come up with a plan to cripple the Israelites. So they send a lot of their Moabite women into the camp of Israel and the Israelites marry them. And the Moabite women influence all of these men uh, to worship the, the gods and the idols of uh, their nation, of the Moabite people. Yeah. And so you just have a whole slew of the Israelite population now being taken away from the faith of God. And we're told the mountain on which uh, they worship these pagans, uh, these pagan uh, idols, and it's on Mount Peor. And what's so heartbreaking is Mount Peor was one of those mountains, one of those high places where Balaam gave the blessing over Israel. Mm. So now this place where God had blessed his people, the people now openly worship another God other than him. And due to this campaign of um, promoting sexual immorality by Balaam, a plague comes through the Israelite camp and it just, uh, kills 24,000 people. Insane. That is not no. good. That is, that is a stupid Wait, amount of people. What's this guy doing? Um, because we're told that he, you know, has the spirit of God come into him. So he's experienced that. And then he yeah. goes back. Yeah, I don't know. Um... Actually, maybe I do. And uh, here's why it would be good for you listeners to listen to part one. Uh, if you haven't listened to part two, this will help you uh, figure it out. In our last episode, Kira, um, we talked about what is it that helped characters like Noah and Enoch to persevere in their faith? Yeah. And what was that? Uh, describe to our listeners what that was. Um, so 
we so we looked at the story of Noah and just having a look at like all right this guy went through a lot and he had to have a lot of trust because he was told to build that ark and the flood water waters didn't come for 120 years so what was going on he was preaching no one was listening it just wasn't working out well for him so how did he still have faith in God even when it seemed as though God might not have been talking to him anymore and we took it back to the, this mm. idea of um, Noah walked faithfully with God. So I think that Noah actively pursued a relationship with God and really put time and effort into keeping that up. So I think, and, and this just came into my head, but Hebrews 11 is a really cool mm. chapter of the Bible. And it's basically like the Hall of Fame or the who's who of the Bible. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> Noah is mentioned. And, but so are a whole bunch of other people, like the, you know, the big Bible characters, Moses, David. And it says in each case, it's by faith. And faith yeah. is not just something that you can pick up and put down. It's something that you develop over time. Yeah, it has to be cultivated and nurtured as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an intentional, intentional thing. So I guess we just answered the question in a way. I think, yeah, yeah. Balaam wasn't interested yeah, and um, I think Balaam is a good warning story because we can do that a lot of the time, right? We have one really good spiritual experience, and then once it's over, we just go back to what we usually oh, do. Oh, yeah. And um, the, uh, uh, I know this is a bit of a stereotype, but I suppose it fits. The, the common one is you go to some sort of camp, yeah. um, you're on a spiritual high because you're not really doing anything else. You're spending all of your time with your friends, and uh, you're spending it engaged in fun activities and lots of spiritual activities and you're hearing all this good inspirational deep stuff and you make a commitment yeah that's it when i go back home reading the bible every day and the spirit of god comes upon you like it did on balaam and then when you go back home you just kind of go back to what you were doing anyway yeah um, that's so true and i think the reason is that there wasn't any commitment there. Um, there was a lot of maybe getting caught up in what was happening, but often there's not a deep commitment. Yeah. And Balaam certainly didn't have any commitment, despite the mercy, despite the commitment which God showed to Balaam, um, Balaam did not reciprocate that in return. Yeah, and he could have just, you know, seen it as a little bit of a fluke. I guess, you know, you can write a lot of things off in your head when you're trying hard enough. You could have really worked on making that talking donkey something else. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Maybe I didn't drink enough water. Man. Yeah. That was some, that was some spell I had, some hallucination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, even King Balak. You think King Balak would have learned something from this, you know? Yeah, like, I mean, but... When you want something bad enough, you're going to keep trying. And, you know, these people, these kings, believe that they had a divine mandate. So mm. why would somebody else have that? Why would somebody else be untouchable? It just wouldn't make sense. Yeah. Well, I think um, we can learn a lot in that case of what to avoid and what not to do, to make commitments to God. Uh and as, as uh, you mentioned earlier to faith isn't something you just pick up, put down and you get to choose. It's uh, like, it's not something you like choose to do each morning. Like, eh, I'm not feeling like, you know, this God thing today. Like, yeah. no, if you have a relationship with God, your desire is every day to spend yeah. time every day to uh, continue that commitment. Oh, oh, I had not think of this. Uh, if we think yeah, of, our relationship with God, like any relationship, um, like a marriage, you commit to someone when you marry them, you commit to being with that person. And the same as with the relationship with God, you commit to having a relationship with him. And yeah, I just don't think that was something Balaam or Balak yeah, were willing to do. Uh, maybe yeah. even some of the yeah, even the people of Israel maybe hadn't quite come to that point where they were willing to go and worship other gods at the very same place where God had blessed them. Yeah. You know? Like, can you imagine this? Can you imagine, like, um, going and uh, if you had a, 
a spouse or something and you're cheating on them and you take another girl back to the place where mm, you got that's engaged so awkward. or back yeah People do or, it or back to a, a place where you had a first date you just feel disgusting oh. you'd you, you know you'd be repulsed yeah. by yourself that's yeah. gross man like that's low that's so bad to do it's inappropriate and you feel so you um, know those are like my guilty pleasure things anyway <laughs> like you read you read <laughs> stories about it and you're just like why would they do that <laughs> yeah it's it uh, like your gut instinct is just that's wrong yeah, isn't it that's like disgusting. you're repulsed by it because you go, where is the, where's the faith? Where's the, yeah. the, the loyalty? Where's the commitment here? And that really is what the author is trying to convey in this story, mm. that in this story, God is the person who is faithful and loyal and committed. And everyone he shows that to turns on him. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everyone in this story turns on God. And that's really heartbreaking. Like, oh, like... Especially when you bring it down to the personal level. Okay, you know, it's easy. It's easy for us to just talk about the Israelites back then. But if we bring it to everyday life, you know, what other things are we prioritizing in our life over our relationship with mm. God? What other things are we doing first thing of the morning, like before we spend any time with God? Or, for sure. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah where is our level of commitment to God? <clears throat> and that's something, you know, individually, each of us has to uh, evaluate. And this isn't um, a guilt trip at yeah. all. This is just uh, reflecting on our personal life. Because if we don't re reflect and if we're not vigilant, um, uh, we we kind of let things slip. For and sure. it's easier for Satan to, uh, to lead us away. But if we're constantly thinking, you know, how can I improve? How can... Um, how can I do better? And not in a legalistic sense, in the in the sense of in the sense of the same way you'd want to do better for someone you yeah. love. You know, how can I treat this person better? Mm. It's mo it's driven out of love. And um, uh, and I think that's a good healthy practice. I think just a quick word of encouragement. Um, you're gonna have those times where it might be a little bit harder. And mm. you know, we have that happen with our real life relationships and friendships, and it gets hard, and you don't even know why. Um. Or, you know, it's hard and you can pinpoint the reason. Maybe, you know, you've had something really tragic happen and you just cry out to God and you're like, why would you do this? What's going on? Mm. And I just like to encourage you to, you know, keep going for that relationship with God. Maybe, you know, what you've been doing, the routine that you've got into has just become something that's just a routine and it's not worship and it's not connection anymore. So maybe... You know, it's time for you to vary it up. See what, you know, see what you can do to best connect with God because it changes, I think, big time. Yeah. And so, you know, I think when you when you seek God and we're promised that, you know, seeking God, we're going to find him. So just, I think, claim that and, you know, know that he's He's there with us. It's just, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit harder to feel that connection. Yeah, I love that working and persevering because I like the key. The key thing that you said there for me was that even when things get difficult, it's not like you throw in the towel yeah, and give up. Yeah, that's it. You you work on it and you persevere and you keep working with God to make it to make it possible to make it work. Mm. Um, here's the last verse uh, I kind of want to wrap up with and. Um, mm. This, this verse is often used, uh, it's a very popular verse, but most people don't know that just a few verses before then, Balaam gets a name drop. So uh, I thought it was really interesting, and I think it ties in with what you were talking about earlier, Kira. It's in Micah chapter 6, verses 5 through to 8, and here's what the prophet Micah, um, or God, is saying to his people. He says, O my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled? And what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, From Acacia Grove to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord, and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn 
for my sins, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And I just got hit by something. Yeah. That last verse, oh, walk humbly yeah. with God. And that's been our theme like yeah. throughout this whole thing, walking with God. And that's in comparison to King Balak and King Balaam. Yeah. Who, you know, is... maybe took a quick jog, <laughs> you know, for Balaam. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Out. <laughs> that's really good. Yeah, he took a quick yeah. jog. And well, if out. you sprint, that's not sustainable. Right? You can't keep running and jogging yeah. forever. That as well. That's right. And here's another thing. Try jogging with someone else's hand in your hand. Uh. Like, that's, <laughs> that's un- can you imagine how unco you two are going to uh. look? Like, that's unsustainable. That's very true. Um, <laughs> but you can walk with someone hand in hand. Yeah. Um, and if, if you think of a father and a son or a father and a daughter, that you walk them hand by hand. Think of a couple. They walk hand in hand. I don't think I've ever seen a couple running hand in hand um, <laughs> or jogging hand in hand. Have you? I don't think so. I feel like I would have clocked it. Um, like maybe, but um, I, I feel like I would have been like, mm, that's disturbing. Oh, the, the worst thing I've ever seen. I, it's so hard to describe. I saw this couple walking and there was one standing in front and the other walking behind. And the pers- the front person had their right arm behind them. Yeah. And it was like holding on to the left hand of that person behind them. And then their left was the right, attached to the right hand of the other person. So just but imagine why? their hand is in an X. <laughs> And they're holding the other person's hand like that. And I saw it, and they kept walking like that for ages. And I was disgusted That's not that. cute. That's uncomfortable. <laughs> that is, it looks so uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but um, all of which is to say, let's not take this analogy too far, Christopher. Um, yeah, Balaam went for a jog, as you said. Balaam went for a jog, and he just gave up. Mm. And here we're told to walk humbly with God yeah. and to do justly. Yeah. And to love mercy. Ah, oh, mercy. That's been our other key theme this whole yeah. time. That God shows mercy. And so we too are called to show mercy. And even all that stuff at the start, you know, uh, what what can I give? He even twice, uh, it says, will I give my firstborn? Will I give the fruit of my body? Like, uh, And that's what the pagan cultures in Balaam's uh, country were doing. They were giving up their firstborn kids mm. to their pagan deities. Yeah. And God says, man, I don't want yeah. that. That's, what would I do with a child? That's disgusting. No. Yeah, that's that's repulsive. Yeah. That's terrible. Don't do that. Um, God wants a, a, he wants a heart. Really. Yeah, that's, um, that idea in, that's what he in Romans 12 of a living sacrifice. Right? Mm. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't want all the other stuff that, you know, back in the Old Testament period and still today, people think a lot of gods want, you know, just, you know, grain or your firstborn. God wants us to live yeah. our life daily for him and to live it with him as well. And that was kind of the message that Jesus gave to the Pharisees as mm. well. He's like, yeah, you guys, you say all these prayers and you won't walk so many steps on the Sabbath. And my favorite is you tithe your mint leaves. <laughs> like that's how, that's how pretentious they were. They'd get their mint one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then the tenth mint leaf. They go, and that one's for God. Like yeah, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus mocks him. And he says, "You guys think you're so holy because you tithe your mint leaves," but he says, "Your heart is rubbish inside mm. your whitewashed tombs. Like, there's no relationship there." And so here, like Jesus, uh, God saying, "You know, you can give me rims, you can give me oil, whatever it is. I'm not that interested." The key thing I want is your heart and yeah. a deep, personal, and intimate relationship with you. That's what God really wants. As you said, a living sacrifice, not um, not firstborn kids, not mint leaves. Yeah. He wants us, really. That's huge. Whew. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, just, I suppose, to wrap up and... Um, 
make a quick appeal. Like uh, when I read the, uh, this story and um, think about the story of the flood as well that we looked at in part mm -hmm. one, God has done everything He can to uh, He's done everything He can to save us from the punishment of sin. He's done everything He can to save us really from our own mistakes and uh, what we've brought upon ourselves. Uh, as we read in the story of Noah. God found grace upon Noah, mm. and that grace is freely open to all of us now to accept that, to accept the sacrifice of Jesus, or uh, to proverbially get on the ark of safety so that we don't have to be afraid of that final judgment. And not only that, but through Jesus, God also uh, breaks down that barrier of sin that was stopping us from having that relationship with him. And we see here in the story of Balaam, that the deepest desire of God is that in the same way that he is faithful and merciful and committed to his people, that they will in turn reciprocate that and want to have a deep personal and intimate relationship with God where they walk with him every day mm. and they grow in that relationship and they are legalistic and giving tenths of their mint leaves and doing everything in practice but not have a fully repentant heart, but instead God wants living sacrifices given to him in us uh, and to have that personal deep connection with him exactly. that we can only have because of the sacrifice of Jesus. So to our listeners, if uh, you have made that commitment, uh, continue to make that commitment. As we said, it's a day by day process. So each day we wake up and we think, how can we, show and reciprocate the same love to God that he's given to us. And for those of you who haven't, and you're, you're thinking about it, you're wrestling about it, I hope that these last two podcasts that we've looked at really honing in on the love, the depth, and the richness of God's mercy mm -hmm. and faithfulness um, has really got you thinking and really uh, convicted your heart to consider the opportunity and the offer of life that God is giving to you. Christopher, do you have any recommended readings? I do. Um, I'm going to recommend a book which uh, actually, my family and I are going through during family worship at the moment, and that is Steps to Christ. Uh, or you might find it also under another t uh, title, Steps to Jesus. And basically, each chapter reflects the different stages or the steps that we take in our journey and relationship with Jesus. And this is a book really accessible to anyone in their faith journey. Um, for new believers who are wanting to know how to strengthen their faith. And as I said, me and my family are all reading it. So people of all age demographics, we're talking from 13 upwards to 40, uh, we're all gaining new insights as we're reading through this book. So I uh, highly recommend this book to everyone and anyone. And I think it'll be a great compliment to everything that we've been looking at today. Mm, awesome. So Kira, uh, where can these people find you if they want to hear more of your voice and they want to know more of the the inner machinations of your mind? <laughs> well, I love people hearing my voice, so you can find me at Marty Warrior Ministries, writing some articles, and at my YouTube channel as well, just search for Curly Josie, and it should pop up as well. Where can these people find you, Christopher? Well, they can find me uh, as well on Mighty Warrior Ministries. And uh, you can find me on um, the After Seven podcast. And actually, before I forget, I'll make a quick plug. Last time we teased uh, Daniel's sermon about Noah mm. and the Flood. This time around, I'm going to tease two sermons. We have mm. uh, a sermon hopefully coming up from uh, Kira Lee all about discipleship. And mm. the sermon after that, um, I just recently uh, preached and... That topic was all about uh, spiritual warfare, but from a very different perspective. One oh, I don't I'm think uh, many of us think of. So awesome. keep an eye out for those two sermons and those accompanying podcasts coming out. Yeah. And um, yeah, I guess you'll find both of us there. Yeah. So look, 
thank you everyone for sticking around. Thank you for uh, hopefully listening to both of these parts and uh, even though you didn't know you were waiting, thank you for waiting for us to <laughs> finish our third and final recording. Oh, done. <laughs> it is done. Oh my goodness, I'm so happy. So, <laughs> Kira and I, we're both going to go and treat ourselves to something nice. I don't know. We, we deserve it. We deserve something. For Kira, it won't have sugar, but it's all good. And um, look, thank you so much for joining us on the After Seven podcast. We hope you have a great day. And with that said, have a good one and good night.